That's right. And this is KSQD, your community radio station for the Monterey Bay at 89.7, 90.7, and 89.5. Around the Monterey Bay, we're streaming live worldwide at ksqd.org. Well, you may have heard of wild crafting or wilding or foraging or any of these words that indicate an effort to go back and figure out how humans used to live on the land and maybe could live on the land. Um, so Jessica Craft Carew has, Carew Craft has written a wonderful book about being wild again, and she herself has gone through a lot of uh, trainings and processes and written about them in this new wonderful book, which I wanted to interview her about. So thank you for being with me here on Talk of the Bay. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. So in your book, um, you talk about kind of this slow awakening to what's around you. You're living in San Francisco, you know, in a high-tech job, (laughs) doing marketing, and something starts to nag at you. What was that something that started to make you feel like maybe this wasn't the life you were meant to be living? Well, it wasn't just um, San Francisco or marketing. This was the epicenter of Silicon Valley tech, um, sort of circa 2015, and I was advising startup companies and CEOs and venture capitalists about how to, you know, sell the story of digital utopia. And everything I was hearing was like, oh, tech is going to solve every possible human problem from, you know, earwax buildup to climate change. And what I was seeing instead was that tech was actually just getting us more glued and addicted to our screens, right? And the problems they were immediately solving were getting food delivery uh, and things that, you know, just seem to make our lives a little bit more convenient and not really addressing uh, the big issues facing us as humanity. And as I looked around, I saw that, you know, myself and my coworkers, we were, you know, underslept, overworked, stressed out, not spending enough time with our families or friends. We were uh, basically kind of going against all of our natural instincts. And for me, it reached a point where I was like, I can't, I just can't do this anymore. I need to be outside. Um, I've got to have fresh air. I've got to stop being glued to this screen, and I need to have that kind of social contact that helps us thrive as humans. Um, So it was a slow kind of boil where eventually I was like, I've got to get out of this. And um, luckily, at that moment, I discovered the movement of rewilding, which is exactly what you were talking about. This idea, uh, which has taken off a little bit in the Silicon Valley circles in terms of the paleo diet, that we as humans are still kind of built in our paleolithic blueprint, right? We're still born as hunter-gatherers, but yet we are facing an evolutionary mismatch in everything we do every day, right? Inside, um, tethered to all sorts of centralized industrial systems, um, not getting what we need to really thrive. So I looked deeper and deeper into that and realized, okay, I want to make a complete 180, I want to go from the center of digital utopia back into the Stone Age and see if um, there's anything I can bring back to my life from the era when we were all hunter-gatherers. And what kind of things could fit our modern world? Because we expect, you know, DoorDash to bring us our dinner. (laughs) We're talking about kind of the absolute extreme uh, moment in which we want everything instantaneously, whereas back then... You could spend your whole day gathering just for your dinner, right? Or maybe eating all the way along. Or you could spend, you know, hours making a basket. How do you, how did you find any kind of fit between these worlds without having to leave it completely, which a few outliers have done, you know, living completely off grid in this garden utopia until they get older and need community, um, which we can talk about in a moment, this myth yeah, of the so survivor it, right and, and the yeah. movies i think you reference the one uh, alone or alive or whatever it's called where they send individuals out into the woods to survive harsh conditions and those are very well we'll talk about that in a moment but well what about that question of you know this complete yeah. schism between these worlds well i think people are feeling i think there's been um kind of a, a long a, a, a trajectory for this kind of discontent that folks feel with a completely technologized life. So I think all along through the 19th and 20th centuries, we've had, you know, back to the land movements and hippies and uh, Thoreau and, 
transcendentalism, you know, so it's been a, a kind of undercurrent in American culture, I think. Uh, but what I found were something called primitive or ancestral skills gatherings. And these are, you know, week long, and I wouldn't call them festivals, but they're sort of skill shares where you can go maybe outside of Santa Barbara or a camp in Yosemite or up in the Pacific Northwest and uh, attend a week-long thing where you can learn the basket weaving, learn the foraging, tan a hide, uh, get some you know basic hunting skills, and hear from folks who have been practicing maybe flint napping, which is making tools out of stone. So you can get this sort of sampler experience of the original human stem, is, is what I like to call it, and uh, see what appeals to you, right? We can't immediately go back into that kind of subsistence lifestyle at all. We just we don't have the land, we don't have the skills, and we don't have the community. But there are um, arts and crafts and skills that we can slowly kind of take on and see what works with us and our lifestyle. So I became really fascinated with foraging. And in the Bay Area, especially in Santa Cruz, there's so many opportunities to find wild, fresh, organic food that people are overlooking. Right, so out in our natural spaces or uh, in the medians of the roads, a lot of our common weeds that we usually take out of the garden are, in fact, more nutritious for us, um, better adapted to the landscape than the the plants that we put in our garden. So I became really interested in foraging and started to hone that skill. And it definitely is something that um, any mod- modern person who just can get outside can start practicing. Right, and it connects you to the landscape. It gives you that boost of nutrition. And it's also fun. So I found that, you know, kind of replacing the dopamine rush of uh, notifications on the phone with the fact that, oh, my gosh, here's a strawberry fruit tree. Um, And the fruits are here and they're abundant and they're delicious. And I'm going to, you know, go pick a whole basket full of them and bring them home to my kids. So there's, there's tons of skills like that that humans have always practiced that have helped us survive that we can still, you know, take up today. I'm certainly um, right with you there because I was raised foraging for mushrooms with my dad and my mom was a big forager for native plants and liked to make herbal remedies out of them in Big Sur. So I'm I'm a longtime forager and I, I'm right with you. You have to know what's edible, of course, and you don't want to poison yourself or eat poison oak yeah, or something. So, But yeah. we, we do have a long foraging um, community here. We have a guy named David Aurora who used to teach mushrooming classes so oh he's the expert he's the top dog in the whole field oh my gosh everybody uses his guide i know it's fantastic yeah excellent so a lot of people listening will say oh yeah we are we are foragers around here but maybe not everyone so if someone wanted to have one of the experiences and not all of your experiences were great i have to say um uh, you can talk about the survival course you went on uh in a moment (laughs) but um what would you say for someone who just wanted to be introduced to the whole concept. Um, that place in Sandy, uh, sorry, Santa Barbara, you mentioned, uh, is that something yeah, that happens regularly? It's every year. Uh, that one in particular is called the Acorn Gathering. And what's what's really unique about these um, these events is that they're family friendly. They're really affordable. You know, it's like three hundred dollars, four hundred dollars for a week of instruction and meals and camping. Um, and I loved it because it's it's a slice of sort of primitive life. It's a it's a recreated village. Nobody's on their phone. It's a complete digital detox. You know, if you just kind of want to try on a more natural life uh, in connection with the elements while you're still with folks, you know, you're not uh, by yourself navigating the wilderness, getting lost or dehydrated. Um, I really recommend it. That's an excellent one. And then there are probably over 30 other uh, ancestral skills or primitive skills gatherings across the U.S. They've been around for 30, 40 years now, uh, and they're a terrific introduction to all of these skills. Wow, that's really inspiring. I know somebody who's been at some of those with their child and said that their kid just really loved it. You know, absolutely. And you talk about bringing your two daughters with you. What was their experience? Oh, yeah. oh they. I mean, it was. it's such a contrast to city and urban life, you know, the way we parent today uh, in a certain demographic. It's, it's all about, you know, you've got to schedule everything. You have to set up a play date uh, three weeks in advance. Uh, kids always have to have these prepackaged snacks with them. Um, we're con- constantly concerned about their safety. We never, never let them go off on their own, don't trust their own autonomy. 
certainly wouldn't give them access to a knife or the ability to make a fire on their own, right? So our children in today's society are really deprived of these uh, essential human experiences that basically all human children had up until recently in the long span of history. So when they go to a gathering like this and there aren't as many rules, there's access to these exciting materials, you know, with proper instruction, a kid as young as five can properly, can handle a, handle a knife, make a fire, find edible food, tag along with a group of kids of multiple ages. Uh, so, so kids absolutely thrive in an environment like that. And when kids are thriving, parents are thriving, right? So I found this is the least stressful parenting environment I've ever <laughs> been in. Um, and, you know, kind of it's like say goodbye in the morning, see them at dinner time. So that, that sort of wonderful thing that a lot of Gen X and uh, baby boomers grew up with, right, in their neighborhoods, kids can get that at, at these events. Do you ever look around and say, this is how humans were supposed to live in community instead of parents by themselves, single parents, you know, with two or three kids trying to make a job and parenting work together? It's, it's a lot to ask in our society, and people are falling apart because of it. It's, uh, it is. Yeah, yeah absolutely. No, um, when anthropologists interview parents from more traditional cultures where that sort of community is intact— uh, the parents never mention the word stress or even understand the concept in relation to their children, you know, whereas that's almost one of the first words that uh, me and my, you know, parenting peers would talk about, like, oh, this is so much more than we ever bargained for. This is a lot of work. There's so much preparation. There's, you know, we're doing the work of the village, the proverbial village, in raising children without that uh, tightly knit community. So absolutely, I, I, I kind of come across it every day where I'm like, oh, I'm, you know, serving all of these functions for my kids, whereas 200 years ago, 10,000 years ago, that would have been served by, you know, our, our clan, our social group, uh, the folks who have been around and supporting us and who we've been supporting for our entire lives. So the way we're doing it now is absolutely not evolutionary, and I think we're seeing the effects of that. Uh, in our children's behavior and in, you know, how parents are responding to this monumental task that we take on. So this rewilding is like an antidote to uh, the ills of some of what we're seeing, the way we've set up our modern, fast-paced world. Uh, tell me about this sort of stressful, <laughs> it sounded stressful, survival course you went on, hoping to learn, you know, some survival skills on top of your foraging. It sounded a bit um, rough, or a little bit yeah. maybe contrived rough, like putting you through stress to, for the sake of toughening you up. Tell me about how you experienced this sort of survival week that you went on. Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, and, and I should say, like, I'm incredibly grateful for this experience, and I call upon the skills that I did learn um, and then further continue to further develop after that week. Like, it, it, it certainly wasn't a disaster at all, but it was a situation, like you said, that was very contrived. I like to call it survivaling instead of surviving because, uh, you know, you take a group of 13 strangers, you put them in the woods, you deprive them of food uh, and sleep, right? So we're kind of put in this situation where we're, we're at our limits. Uh, and then, you know, we're learning skills like how to make friction fire, how to find and purify water, how to build shelter out of available, you know, tree materials and duff. Um but then there's this this kind of crazy paradox where the instructors are, you know, they have good accommodations, they have plenty of food, and so it, it kind of presents a situation where you feel like you're a little bit cap captive, um, and they have control over what your schedule is and what you're doing and what the skills are you're learning. So psychologically, it does not resemble uh, hunter-gatherer life, Right. And the fact that we're with strangers is also another stressor where it's like, OK, well, I've got to get to know these people. Um, how do I know if I can trust them? And is this actually sort of a covert um, way to get us to build you know, our social bonds, et cetera? Um, so the psychological mind games that, that accompanied it, I didn't think were necessary for learning those skills. And yet uh, what I found in my research was that you know, institution after institution, there's lots of survival skills schools. They all sort of use the same tactic. And I think it's, you know, part of it is, is this American myth of, you know, you've got to be really tough in the wilderness and uh, you have to be kind of deprived in order to feel like learning these skills are necessary. Um, and I found that that's, that's not actually how human communities thrive in the wild. 
You know, it's, it's, uh, hunter gatherer life is not necessarily that stressful in contrast to how we live, you know, kind of in this constant state of, um, the HPA axis, uh, activation and overloading our cortisol. This is not the, uh, the way we evolved, right? Threats would come and we would face them. Uh, but then they would go away for the vast majority of time, whereas our stress in daily life today is pretty much chronic, right? And that's and we see that in, the, in our rates of stress-related illnesses. Uh, but anyway, getting back to the to the wilderness course, it um you know it, it was a terrific week where I did gain those skills and you know made a bunch of friends uh, and ultimately survived to the best of my ability. And uh, writing about it was was kind of a healing experience as well. And if you just joined me on Talk of the Bay, I'm Rachel Ann Goodman. I'm speaking here with Jessica Carew Craft, the author of Why We Need to Be Wild, about her experiences learning to gather and hunt and be with nature in a way that sustains body and mind and spirit, both communally as well as biologically. Um, I wanted to ask you if you think some of these television reality shows uh, contribute to the myth that we could survive alone in in the wilderness for a length of time what do you have you watched Uh, alone is that what it's called oh yeah yeah exactly the history channel's alone series now i think it's in its ninth or tenth season it's it's wildly popular and uh actually many of the folks that i would meet at these ancestral skills gatherings would be recruited to go on these shows because they have those hunting and trapping and kind of you know, making everything they need from nature. They have those skills and have been practicing and teaching them. So a friend of mine, Monia Sibo, you know, she recently was the first woman to win one of those alone challenges on the reality show. And I have the utmost admiration for her. She is just incredibly badass um, and is able to survive in those extreme environments. But once again, it does not reflect human history at all. Um, it, it, that would be a catastrophe for a, a person of a traditional hunter-gatherer clan to be completely alone for that amount of time. They would have the skills to survive, right? But it's, it's not the ideal, and it's not um, the way that human communities thrive. So I do have a problem with the fact that uh, people are, are learning these skills and they think that it's, they've got to have them all and they have to do it alone um, in order you know, to access that wilderness and that feeling of self-sufficiency because that's, that's just not how, how humans have done it for the 300,000 years that we have evidence of being Homo sapiens species. Um, but on the other hand, it's done a great deal to popularize and uh, make it attractive to learn those skills. And I think, you know, as we're facing different challenges uh, as the human community, whether that's pandemic, um, climate change, you know, political breakdown, our centralized systems failing for several days, you know, when we have power outages, et cetera, and you have, we've got the landslides in Santa Cruz. I think it's wonderful for people to learn those survival skills so that they feel confident that they can face those challenges, right, and to know how to find food, how to find water, how to make shelter. Um, and I wish that it was, you know, part of our kind of standardized curriculum. I think, um, you know, to be a human on Earth, you really should, should have those skills, and then everything else can come sort of after that. Uh, so getting back to the show, it's, it's really fun to watch. It's uh, scary. It's realistic. But it does not reflect how humans actually evolve to live. Right. Um, I'm curious, too, just to get your thoughts on, you know, this. there's sort of an undercurrent, unspoken, but you do address it, which is there's always a part of us that wants to be prepared for a real breakdown, like a really extensive breakdown of systems. You know, we've seen a little rehearsal during pandemic Mm-hmm. We we mm-hmm. in California have had wildfires and other catastrophes kind of pile on us recently. And I'm wondering, you know, if there's, when you mentioned climate change, sort of a sense that we need to up our self-sufficiency as groups of maybe bioregions, if not neighborhoods, in terms of our resilience. And, and maybe resilience involves learning how to cook whatever food is right around you, like acorns I've never tried. And I live in an acorn forest, right? I've just mm-hmm. heard it's hard mm-hmm. to get the tannins out. So what would you say to that kind of uh, counterbalancing idea that maybe we all need to learn a little bit just for our own self-sufficiency, if not survival? I love that. I love that. And and also, you know, as long as we're marketing this idea, it's really fun. <laughs> it's, um, you know, and it's, it's enjoyable to be outside and learning those things and 
collecting the acorns. Um, the leaching process that you're talking about, you have to remove the tannins. But um, there are many, many different ways to do it. And, and I do encourage folks, like we have, you know, just millions and millions of acres of oak trees that are incredibly abundant across the state, all of which are edible. Um, and there's, there's, you know, enough for humans to share with all the creatures that thrive on them as well. So that's a great place to, to kind of start with wild food is to learn how to process those acorns. And I think this idea you're, you're talking about with bioregions, neighborhoods, you know, small groups, even, you know, family cohorts getting together to practice some of these skills in the event that some system fails. I think it's a really wise idea. And, uh, and, and not just out of fear, right, but out of that kind of joy, out of this idea that, you know, 200 years ago, all the indigenous Californians were living and subsisting on this land without advanced technology. So we know it can be done. This is kind of the best place. Uh, that's why we had so many Native American tribes living in California. It's one of the most diverse uh, in terms of, you know, the uh, communities living across the state. And the wild food is, is incredibly abundant. So looking to the indigenous traditions, understanding uh, the living history of the Native people here who are still practicing many of these things, getting connected to them, uh, connecting to your own ancestral traditions of harvesting food, and uh, whatever survival traditions are in your own lineage. I think all of that's really important, uh, super educational for children. And then, you know, it has that added benefit of you are prepared, you're ready for whatever might happen. And when when all else fails, you can watch a YouTube video <laughs> about how to do all this. I was going to ask you, you know, we're living right on the ocean here where we are, and um, there's so much seafood right on the rocks. But you have to know when you can do that. And you don't want to eat mussels, for example, the wrong time of year. So even yes. and then you want to have to you want to learn how to cook it um, without using your camp stove, right? So have you ever learned to make a fire so you can cook things like mussels? Uh, in a basket, that would be kind of the ultimate um, success, I think, because who wants to eat them raw? Not not me. (laughs) (laughs) What do you think about, uh, have you ever gotten to that step of making fire out of flint and all that? Oh, yeah, yeah. So friction fire, right? One of the oldest human skills, and people kind of characterize it as rubbing two sticks together, but it's actually you know, it's uh, if you've got a board on the ground, which is your hearth board, and then you can actually twirl a, a, a stick that you've whittled, and then as you're twirling it against the hearth board, you can create a 700-degree kind of tinder box, right? And so a coal is created through that friction, and then you blow that coal into life, put it into a tinder bundle, and then you have fire. It's uh, it's a skill that takes a little while to, to to master, and it's certainly dependent on weather conditions and on the materials that you have on hand. But it is one of the oldest, most primitive um, survival skills that I think is, is super thrilling to learn. You know, we're all captivated by fire. That's our original television, um, and it's our original source of, of cooking and of light and heat. Uh, so I think it's a fundamental kind of primal connection, and it's certainly fulfilling to be able to find food, uh, make a fire, and then cook it on that. Like that's yeah, you're right. That is that's the pinnacle of of the human survival experience that you can share with others and enjoy. Um, and yeah, if, if folks are interested in that, there's uh, there are a lot of you know there's there's new foraging organizations popping up to show you exactly how to collect, when it's appropriate to collect, what to stay away from, what might be poisonous. And I always advise folks, you know, reading a guidebook is great. Watching a YouTube video is great. But the best thing is to go out with somebody who knows what they're doing, um, who, you know, hasn't, hasn't run into those difficult situations with uh, suffering too much with the, with the wrong mushroom or the bad plants that gave them some sickness. Uh, but the qualified individual, going out with them, there's, there's nothing better than learning from that expert. Uh, and then you can practice on your own. Sounds really fun. In the little bit of few minutes we have left, Jessica, I wonder how have you integrated all this knowledge into your life currently? Have uh, are you living outside? <laughs> what? How is it uh, manifesting on your everyday life? Yeah. Well, so the book really was. You know, I, I began this investigation. I was curious for myself, but mostly I wanted, you know, as a writer, as a journalist, as a as former anthropologist, I wanted to document the people who were able to subsist with these Paleolithic skills. 
But the more I learn from them, the more I realize, like, oh, I really like this. This is really satisfying. This is this is super fun. Um, and so I started acquiring them. And it's still a process where, you know, it's like um, I am trying to, you know, stay in the practice. A couple weekends ago, I was with a group of friends, and we butchered a couple of goats, um, you know, everything from – you know, skinning them, gutting them, you know, processing the meat, making the jerky, you know, disposing of the bones, making the broth, all this stuff. So I'm still practicing taking those opportunities to learn from folks who know more than I do. Uh, but I would say, you know, I have I have a practice. I go out every day into a natural space, whether that's the land I live on in the Sierra foothills or if I'm visiting the Bay Area, it's, you know, a space in the 4.4 million acres of open space that we can enjoy here. Uh, and I try to, to go out without an agenda, find wild food, you know, um, hone my botanical identification skills, look for mushrooms, track animals. So it's, it's a daily practice. It's something that really keeps me centered and grounded in these difficult times that we're experiencing. Um, and I love to teach. I love to bring people out with me, show them these basic skills. And, and what I found is that, Rarely does anyone not enjoy it. I mean, uh, sometimes, you know, being outside can be uncomfortable, but there's there's a practice of resilience that you gain through going out in any weather conditions, through, you know, not suffering, but kind of staying present in those, the heat, the cold, um, the mosquitoes, et cetera. So I love I love sharing this experience, and I, and I kind of need it now after spending these five years researching and learning with folks. Sounds wonderful. Do you ever get down to the Santa Cruz area? I will, not regularly, but I should. It's such a gorgeous space. Absolutely. I would love to. Well, if you ever are, get in touch and we'll uh, find you a place to stay and maybe we'll have um, you know some sort of event with you. So um, it's exciting to talk to you and thank you for your book. It's been really wonderful to read. It re-inspires me to find more food on my own property that I can eat and besides the yes. garden. <laughs> so... Thank you for writing it and for spending the time here with us on Talk of the Bay. This is Jessica Carewcraft with a K at the end, K-R-A-F-T. You can find her book, which is called Why We Need to Be Wild. And uh, I know we do. So <laughs> thank you so yeah. much for your time. It's been really a pleasure. Thank you so much. It's great. All right. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. This is Talk of the Bay on KSQD, Santa Cruz, 90.7 FM, your listener-supported community radio station for the Monterey Bay. I'm Rachel Ann Goodman. I'll see you again next week, which is Thanksgiving, I think, isn't it? Yep, coming right up. Coming up is First Person Singular, and after that, it's the kooky side of crazy. Stay tuned.